Hi, everyone. Welcome to our ultrasound webinar hosted by the Society of Hospital Medicine. We have a great lineup of cases from around the nation tonight and internationally to share with you. During this pandemic, uh, POCUS has been a powerhouse tool, as many would say, for COVID and non-COVID cases. So this webinar, we're going to bring you high yield cases that are a lot of pearls here from around the nation. Those of you who are on this chat, we have quite a bit here joining us. Feel free to use the chat box feature. We'll have some of our Ultron expertise chiming in and responding as well. This is intended to be for novice, uh, intermediate, and advanced users. So we know there's a spectrum of people, and we hope to have you share some pearls uh, that will be beneficial for your practices. Our moderators tonight are Dr. Gordy Johnson. He's uh, a co-chair with me in the Ultrasound SIG community and executive council co-chair. He's from Legacy Health in Portland, Oregon. I'm from Regents Hospital and Health Partners in St. Paul, Minnesota, also uh, affiliated with the University of Minnesota Medical School. We're glad to have you. We have quite the lineup here, as you can see. There's uh, speakers from all over the nation and uh, throughout the world. And we hope to uh, uh, move into that right off, right off the bat here. We have about three to four minutes per speaker with some minor comments right after that. And we'll kind of move on uh, in a fast paced uh, manner here. First up, we have Dr. Sanjay Patel. He's an associate program director in internal medicine in Riverside Methodist Hospital. He's an assistant professor in Ohio State, Ohio University Heritage College of Medicine on the case, a cauliflower or a bear paw. Dr. Patel. Uh, thanks, Benji. Thanks, Gordy. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to this Pocus Pearl webinar. And looks like I have the honor of starting off with our first case. So let's get to it. Uh, I've got a 63 year old man with hypertension, diabetes, CKD, BPH comes to the emergency room with nausea and vomiting. On exam, he is tachycardic, ill appearing, and in mild distress. His abdominal exam is notable for bilateral CVA tenderness. He has mild pedal edema, uh, but otherwise his systemic exam is unremarkable. A rapidly obtained BMP in the emergency room shows a BUN of 53 and a creatinine of 3.2 with a baseline of about 1.7 one month prior. Given the AKI and flank tenderness, you're worried about a genitourinary pathology and you perform a bedside ultrasound. Here is an image of the right upper quadrant. We can see the cortex of the right kidney with a large anechoic area in the center consistent with severe hydronephrosis. You move over to the left upper quadrant uh, and you see a very similar finding. You see the renal cortex with another large anechoic area in the center of the left kidney consistent with severe hydronephrosis. Here are some still shots of the uh, images of the renal parenchyma. You can see in uh, both the right and the left kidneys, the central dilation of the, the renal pelvis and distortion of the renal architecture, uh, particularly noticeable on the image on the lower right-hand corner. This is often referred to as the bear claw. Thanks, Benji and Gordy for the uh, title for the slides. Um, I guess the one on the left looks kind of like a floret of cauliflower, if you will. Um, maybe that's a new eponym we come up with. Uh, but uh, th these are markers of uh, what you see with uh, severe hydronephrosis with distortion of the renal architecture. Just a, a little bit of an advanced pearl is rarely uh, a central dilation, especially this large, can be vascular in nature. Um, something like a renal artery aneurysm, so something you can help to differentiate between the two is looking at the pulsation and color Doppler that might help you differentiate the two if you, if you did have any particular questions. Um, just to wrap up the case, our patient had bilateral uh, hydronephrosis and a pelvic ultrasound demonstrated a, a dilated bladder with a large mass that involved the bladder neck and possibly the prostate. The bedside ultrasound allowed for us to get a rapid urology consult, placement of bilateral nephrostomy tubes, and a cystoscopy, which confirmed a suspected diagnosis of neurothelial carcinoma. And I chose this particular case to highlight the importance and the ease of uh, using basic genitourinary pocus in patients with acute, acute kidney injury, particularly help out, help rule in or rule out obstructive neuropathy. Fantastic, Dr. Patel. Thanks for leading us off with a fantastic case here. So I'm going to pose this question to Gordy. So what is it, a cauliflower or bear paw? What do you think? Uh, hey, man, I'm from the Pacific Northwest. I think that's a bear paw. We've got bears out here. You guys are farmers there in the Midwest, right? It looks more like a cauliflower. Uh, you tell I, me. I think uh, it looks like a cauliflower on the on the left, but I stick with the bear paw as well. That's what my I grew All up right. with. So we're gonna we're gonna agree to disagree then. 
And I agree, Sanjay, that was a great case. Uh, really low hanging fruit for hospitalists and other acute care medicine people to go right in with your probe when you get AKI and you just rule in or rule out hydronephrosis. Binary question, immediately can make a decision and uh, move the patient along. Don't wait for a formal study. Certainly can follow it up with a formal study as we often recommend, but you can get the patient moving in the right direction. Uh, Benji, what else do you th um, think of though when you see hydronephrosis like this in, or, or a dilated renal pelvis? What other mimics do you see? Well, uh, Gordy, uh, this, uh, Dr. Patel mentioned some of these. I think the anechoic, uh, the renal pelvis sometimes can re resemble that um, the mild hydronephrosis, right? So you can see prominent renal vasculature, especially in these young patients. You get to see that a ton. A parapelvic cysts, I've been fooled by that many times. So for the cysts, I check the long and the transverse views and then see if it communicates with that renal pelvis. For uh, really parapelvic cysts are really, I think of it as non-communicating and hydronephrosis communicates. And so uh, the best practice, as uh, Dr. Patel mentioned, put on the color Doppler, the same area that demonstrates prominent vessels sometimes can be seen. So blood and urine both appear black on ultrasound. So it's important to differentiate with color. And sometimes color can blatantly disturb, uh, show that uh, AV malformations as well. So being careful for that and scan those kidneys, look for that bare paw, and so don't forget the color Doppler. So maybe with that, uh, for sake of time, we're gonna keep moving along. Uh, hand it over to Gordy here next for our next introduction. Yeah, thanks, Benji. So our next uh, person is coming to us from New Delhi, India, and she's gonna talk to us a little about hockey in India, I guess, here. So this is Yagya Alavat, and uh, go ahead, Yagya. Hello, everyone. So I'll be discussing something which is seen very commonly in India. Here we have a 34 year old woman who presented with shortness of breath for seven months, which was gradually progressive. And currently she had difficulty doing household activities, also had palpitation for 15 days and central chest pain radiating to neck and left arm for last 10 days. All her symptoms aggravated on exertion and relieved on rest. So review of system was positive for orthopnea, PNT, and easy fatigability, and her past medical history was unremarkable. On physical exam, her vitals were normal. On cardiac auscultation, there was a murmur present at, at the apex, both in systole and diastole. Her lungs were clear to auscultate. So focus was performed, and here we have a parasternal long axis view showing hockistic appearance of anterior mitral leaflet in diastole. So this is due to commissural fusion between the two valve leaflets, which restricts the movement at the tip of the valve, suggestive of mitral stenosis, and most common cause being rheumatic heart disease. There is also left atrial enlargement seen in this image. Uh, so this is a Doppler view showing backflow of blood from left ventricle into the left atrium, seen as an eccentric blue jet. So blue denotes the flow going away from the ultrasound probe and red towards it. We can see uh, multiple specks of color within this regurgitant jet called aliasing, which is due to turbulence of flow and high flow velocities. So this patient had both mitral stenosis and mitral regurgitation, and she was diagnosed to have rheumatic heart disease. Here are some other images showing similar findings. So this is uh, another example of hockistic appearance as seen in rheumatic heart disease. You can notice that the anterior mitral leaflet is kind of kinked at the tip. This image also shows a well-circumscribed mass present in the left atrium and left atrium is significantly enlarged. There is also some dilation of the right ventricle noted in this picture. Here we have an apical four chamber view, again showing a stenotic mitral valve. There is reduced excursion of the leaflets. So um, ideally this Doppler window should have been over the valve so we could see this blue regurgitant jet going through the valve to call it mitral regurgitation. Here is the parasternal short axis view showing the classic fish mouth appearance of the mitral valve. We can see that the leaflets are thickened and there is reduced movement there, suggestive of mitral stenosis. 
there is also some amount of pericardial effusion seen in this picture. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Yagya. Uh, Gordy, this is a case from India. Uh, truly remarkable uh, what ultrasound can do with global health uh, overall, right? So I hear uh, you're an international traveler. Uh, what's your experience with ultrasound overseas and uh, just global health? International traveler, no more. We're in the middle of a pandemic. But yeah, in, in previous years, or as I say, BC before Corona, yeah, you know, you're, you're in places remotely where there's not formal echo. Obviously here we would be getting a formal echo sooner rather than later and having our cardiologist colleagues make that diagnosis. But this is the kind of case that you might see in a village clinic somewhere and be sending the person into the city knowing what you're dealing with, just having to prove it. So very helpful out there in low resource settings and similar, I would think in places like rural Minnesota sometimes when you don't have uh, echo techs and ultrasound techs around all the time. So great case, uh, thank you. I'm gonna navigate next to uh, our next speaker here. This is Dr. James Berner. Uh, Dr. Berner is an ultrasound director in hospital medicine at Regents Hospital in St. Paul, Minnesota. He's a clinician educator there. Uh, he's gonna present on true lies, what's actually lying around in the lung. James? Great, okay, thank you, Benji. So our case begins with a 79-year-old gentleman who presents with shortness of breath brought in from home by EMS. He has a history of dementia, heart failure, and a recent hospitalization about four weeks ago with a C acute CHF exacerbation at that time. He's somnolent and can't really provide additional history. He's tachypnic, hypoxic, tachycardic, and needing some additional O2. His labs are shown here, and his chest x-ray shows bilateral, small, pleural effusions with mild interstitial changes similar to his x-ray from about four weeks ago. He's given furosemide in the ER and admitted to medicine for a presumed acute on chronic CHF exacerbation. When I saw the patient, I proceeded with my routine ultrasound exam for someone who presents with shortness of breath and noted this pattern of normal A lines with lung sliding in both his upper right and left uh, lobes of uh, right and left lung. As I moved to the right lung base, this image was obtained. You can clearly see a consolidated lung pattern in this area with dynamic air bronchograms that move with respiration. There's also a small associated pleural fusion and notably not much lung volume loss in this area. This next image is taken from one rib space superior to the last image. It shows an area of consolidation with an irregular thickened pleural line and again some dynamic air bronchograms. In contrast, this image was obtained at the left lung base. Here we do not see the same signs that we noted in the prior images. The lung is more mobile with a sinusoidal wave type motion within a simple pleural effusion and no dynamic air bronchograms are seen. As I was exiting the patient's room, I ran into the patient's wife who finally arrived and gave some additional history. She knows that the patient's weight has been decreasing and ever since he came home from the hospital last time, he's been coughing each time he tries to eat a meal. She notes since the day prior to admission, he had been having some fevers and chills. The additional history and the point of care ultrasound findings really changed our diagnosis from acute CHF exacerbation to a right lower lobe pneumonia, likely due to aspiration. This case highlights some of the differences between atelectasis and consolidation. Uh, next slide, please. There we go. Although these findings can appear similar, there are some differences that can assist you in your decision making. Atelectasis is often accompanied by a loss of lung volume, static air bronchograms, and sinusoidal movements of the atelectatic lung within the simple pleural effusion. In contrast, consolidation often has a relatively small amount of volume loss in a low bar consolidation. If there's not a full low bar consolidation, you may see a shred sign, which is created by the interface of fluid-filled alveoli and aerated lung. You will likely also see thickened pleural line, dynamic air bronchograms, and typically a loss of the sinusoidal movement that is due to lung inflammation. We'll end with a couple more examples of atelectasis and consolidation. Here's another example of atelectatic lung. Here you see static air bronchograms, sinusoidal movement of the lung, 
and volume loss with an associated pleural effusion. This next image shows another consolidation. Here, you notice there's dynamic air bronchograms, a shred sign that's at the, at the base there, uh, created by that interface with fluid and air-filled alveoli. This final still image very well demonstrates this uh, fluid air interface within the lung that creates the shred sign. Hopefully this will shed some light on the lung the next time you find yourself at the bedside thinking, is that atelectasis or consolidation? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Werner. Appreciate you going through that case. Such a helpful case. To, um, and so Gordy, when you've seen a patient in Portland Hospital um, with undifferentiated dyspnea, uh, using ultrasound, um, well, without all using ultrasound, do you often slurp them? I'm assuming that's what you do, right, in Portland? Uh, that sounds like some kind of uh, drink from Minnesota when it's dark and cold and you're like ice fishing. What is slurped? Yeah, there's a lot of breweries here, but uh, no, it's not a it's not a type of beer. No, I think uh, you know slurp is what we call steroids, Lasix antibiotic responsive process. It's when uh, we get these admissions with undifferentiated shortness of breath and you slurp them. So I think uh, what ultrasound can do truly is what Dr. Werner has uh, shown here from congestive heart failure all the way to consolidation. It really helps narrow that differential. It's a powerful portable uh, diagnostic tool in the pocket of a physician. So, so thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Werner. I'm gonna next uh, hand it off to Gordy. To yeah, next, so week. next we have a doctor. I'm gonna try my best on the last name. She, she up Kopsky. Uh, who's coming from us from UC San Diego, and she's going to tell us about the heart of the matter. Go ahead, Mila. Thank you, Gordy. Um, so yeah, the case is titled The Heart of the Matter. Um, we're going to start off with a 57-year-old gentleman with a history of metastatic sigmoid colon cancer who was recently taken off of colchicine for treatment of pericarditis, secondary to side effects. His chief complaint was shortness of breath. Um, vitals were notable for tachycardia and a blood pressure that was borderline at 92 over 60, otherwise satting well on room air. Uh, his exam was notable for a regular tachycardic rhythm with no murmurs. His lungs were clear and he had no lower extremity edema. We performed a point of care ultrasound to evaluate gross LV um, ejection fraction, as well as uh, look for a pericardial effusion. So here we see the parasternal long axis view of the heart. First, I want you to take a look at the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve, which is coming close or at some point touching the intraventricular septum, suggesting a grossly preserved EF. Um, what also comes to mind is this anechoic space at the top of the ultrasound, right in front of the right ventricle, which to me suggests presence of pericardial effusion. Um, and if you look closely, you may see it also layering at the bottom part of the screen behind the left ventricle. Um, and depending on your view, you can see the descending thoracic aorta there, which would suggest that this anechoic structure or potential fluid collection is actually in the pericardial space and not in the pleural space. Um, in order to confirm these findings, we move on to a parasternal short axis view, where again, even better, you can visualize this anechoic uh, structure directly above the left ventricle and also layering posterior to it. And again, in front of the descending thoracic aorta, suggesting presence of a circumferential uh, pericardial effusion. Next, to do our due diligence, we move on to the apical four-chamber view. In this view, you can very well appreciate layering on the left side of the screen directly um, outside of the right ventricle, an anechoic structure, which looks roughly one centimeter in size if you use the, um, the depth indicators on the right-hand side of the screen. Uh, you can also appreciate that the RV is not enlarged, nor is it collapsing significantly, um, which is reassuring in this case. Lastly, we move on to the sub xiphoid view where you can thoroughly appreciate the circumferential nature of this, um, what appears to be a pericardial effusion. Also, in this view, you can appreciate the size, which also appears to be about one centimeter, suggesting a moderate size pericardial effusion. What I also appreciate in this view at the bottom of the screen is the pericardium, which compared to you know, other pericardiums, if you've done a few of these exams, it does appear to be thickened 
and brighter than what I would normally expect. This to me raises concern for you know, possible chronic pericarditis or malignant involvement of the pericardium. As a result of these studies, we ordered a formal echo as the patient had had a echocardiogram done several weeks prior without evidence of pericardial effusion. Therefore, a formal echo was uh, ordered to essentially confirm this pericardial effusion and look for any evidence of tamponade. Cardiology was immediately consulted to discuss resumption of treatment for prior pericarditis. Some pearls from these images. Uh, one thing to remember is when you're imaging and looking for pericardial effusion is to image the heart in multiple windows to ensure that you're looking at a true pericardial effusion and not a you know, pericardial fat pad or pleural effusion. Um, also maximizing the depth so that you also see the descending thoracic aorta and that will help you distinguish between a left-sided pleural effusion versus a pericardial effusion. If you're ever in doubt, always image the pleural space to evaluate for a concurrent effusion. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mila. That was a great case. Um, you mentioned about epicardial fat, and I find sometimes it's hard to tell the difference. Um, Benji, can you give us some tips about uh, trying to differentiate epicardial fat from a small pericardial effusion? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks, uh, uh, Dr. Mila, for walking through that. Um, it's a common mimic, epicardial fat pad. Um, what you see is that uh, heterogeneous, it's hypoechoic, it's tissue-like. And so one of the differentiating features, I think it's moves with heart uh, cardiac activity. So it's usually not, it's not circumferential and it's really not clinical significance. So normally you look at it in people that have a higher BMI or elderly patients. And the best place to look at is the RV outflow tract and the peristoral long axis view. So again, I agree with uh, Dr. Mila here, employ multiple views to differentiate between the anterior fat pad and pericardial effusions. That being said, uh, loculated um, focal effusions, I think can be particularly challenging. Uh, and so it's okay to say, I don't know. And it's okay to move towards getting some comprehensive echo if, you, if you're truly having difficulty uh, obtaining those. Perfect, so thank you very much, folks. So we'll keep moving along here. The next speaker is Dr. Wu Moon. Uh, Dr. Moon is from Mercy Hospital in St. Louis, Missouri, and he'll be presenting Lumps in the Beans. Dr. Moon. Thank you, Benji, for the introduction. Um, thank you to Society of Hospital Medicine for this opportunity to share my case. Um, I was evaluating a 33-year-old female patient, no significant medical or surgical history in the past, and uh, no abdominal or genital urinary symptoms at the time of my exam. Uh, so ultrasound evaluation appeared to be just as routine to start. Uh, the first clip on the left here shows the patient's right kidney just below the liver. It's free of hydronephrosis or a large mass. And then as I focus my attention to the left kidney seen just below the spleen here on the second clip, I noticed a circular mass-like structure about two by two and a half centimeters in size. And so at this point, I didn't know what was going on. So I did what, a, what any non-radiologist would do. I took these images down to the radiology suite to discuss these findings with someone. And it turns out uh, the patient had a renal ultrasound completed about 10 years ago and just didn't know about it. Uh, we were able to compare these images of the two structures side by side, and they appeared very similar uh, in size and appearance. And so the mass-like structure in question was finally given a diagnosis of hypertrophied renal column of burden. And following our encounter, she received a follow-up ultrasound study, which showed no changes at all after a few months. And so renal column, as you can see from this net or image on the left, is often referred to as the column of Burton. And that's named after the French anatomist who first described it a very long time ago. Uh, hypertrophied columns are redundant renal parenchyma that fails to resorb during development after the upper and lower subkidneys fuse. And these hypertrophied renal columns that are, uh, are actually considered a normal congenital variant. They're generally less than three centimeters in size, located in the upper to middle uh, thirds of the kidney. They're usually contiguous with the adjacent renal cortex. And you can see this connection between the renal cortex and the hypertrophied renal column in the patient's image, emphasized by this uh, yellow arrow on the far right of the image here. And another example of this hypertrophied column is shown in the middle upper uh, image. Uh, and that hypertrophied renal column actually contains a hypoechoic renal pyramid as well. 
And in the lower image, you can see a renal cell carcinoma, which is not contiguous with the renal cortex and is more hyperechoic in nature. And it often distorts the contour of the kidney as well. So I wanna conclude my set of slides by emphasizing that the hypertrophied renal column of Burton is a normal variant, it's a benign condition. We see it more commonly on the patient's left side and around the middle to upper part of the kidney. And on ultrasound, they are contiguous with the renal cortex with a smooth contour and is most often isoechoic to the cortex. And hypoechoic pyramids can also be present within the columns themselves. And most importantly, it is very important to differentiate that from a renal cell carcinoma, which is more hyperechoic complex structures that can distort the contour of the kidney. But in some ambiguous cases, you may have to get a CT with contrast to achieve this differentiation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moon, for walking through that. Uh, Gordy, have you seen any of these cases before? This is a unique finding. Uh, I have not seen that. I would have sworn one of those was a renal cell carcinoma if I didn't. I, I have not been familiar with that diagnosis. That was really helpful. No, I appreciate it. And yeah, this, these are tricky. So sometimes, uh, even though they're present in some healthy populations, if in doubt, sometimes you have to move towards that comprehensive ultrasound. But thanks for the tips there. Uh, those of us can develop on it and see if we can differentiate between them. So. Thanks again. We're going to keep moving along for sake of time here. Our next speaker is Dr. Meltiadi Issa. He's a consultant and ultrasound director in the Division of Hospital Medicine uh, in Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. He's the current president of the Society of Hospital Medicine Minnesota chapter. Uh, and tonight he's presenting on nearly 100 and a big heart. Dr. Issa. Thank you, Benji. Uh, you know, age is just a number, it's the moral of the story, I guess. But so I have a delightful lady here, 97 year old, uh, history of hypertension, lives independently. She came in with a call of productive of clear sputum, progressive dyspnea for five days, and some fatigue. No chest pain, no fevers, doesn't have history of COPD or asthma, uh, no sick contacts or recent travel, and her medications are only lisinopril and amlodipine. Physical exam, uh, she was standing at 90% on room air, but she was tachypneic in the upper 20s. Um, she had no fever and blood pressure was normal. Uh, she had some throat erythema, but no exudates on lymphadenopathy. Cardiac auscultation, she had systolic ejection murmur, and her JVP was not visualized at 45 degrees. Her lungs, she had some wheezing scattered, and she had bibasal or crackles, no rashes, no skin rashes. So EKG, um, really an old EKG looks very similar, so she did not have any acute changes. And her labs in the ED, she had no white count. That was the main thing they were looking for. Her um, BMP seems okay as well, nothing standing out. BBG, she has some respiratory alkalosis. She's washing out CO2. Uh, Procal was high. Um, so really, you know, they were not sure what's going on. So the next step they did is a chest x-ray. And this shows some uh, mild testicial edema and new uh, small pleural effusions. So the ED called this uh, mild CHF exacerbation. And because there was no infiltrate, you know, they called it upper respiratory infection. Uh, and they want to admit her for PTOT, safety eval, and maybe a little bit of a diuresis. They gave her 20 milligrams of furosemide before um, bringing her in. So when I saw her, um, she, her dyspnea was getting worse after the Lasix. So um, did a point of care cardiac ultrasound and kind of jumps at you right away is how thick these walls are. Uh, pretty thick septum here and posterior wall very, very thick. And if you look at the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve, it's really coming really close into that LV outflow track. And this, even the septum is coming into it, kind of almost blocking it all together. So something is fishy here. Uh, short axis, uh, not great, but you can see the, how thick the walls are, still very thick, circumferential, uh, you know, very thick walls there. Yep, and this is at the mitral valve level. And there was next one we did is under that, that's at the papillary muscle level, and you still see the thick walls, and this is papillary muscles. Um, so very, uh, very thick walls. So apical view was kind of more uh, revealing here, where you see the septum is really, really thick. 
And then the anterior leaf of the mitral valve is coming really uh, close to that septum, even in systole. Uh, it reminds you of the systolic and anterior motion of the mitral valve that you hear about in uh, Hocum. Um, I'm sorry, this is the Mayo Clinic convention where we flip the right is left and the left is right. Uh, but this is, you know, the left ventricles on your left side and the right ventricles on the right side. So another view that's a bit closer. Here, if you focus a little bit, you'll see how in systole, how the mitral valve is being pushed into the outflow tract. And uh, if you put color on this, which we did, but I didn't include images, it's kind of fun to see how, um, you know, there's the mosaic uh, pattern indicating that there's turbulence of flow. So there's really an obstruction of the outflow tract. Now, it really is not as important for us right now to figure out if this is Hocum, she's a 97 year old lady, or is it a hypertensive heart disease? Remember, as we get older, the uh, aorta becomes portraits and the angle between the uh, ascending aorta and the septum becomes, it changes with age and then the septum gets pushed into the LV outflow. And when, you, when you're on the right, um, in certain situations where you are low on volume, whether it is you're dehydrated or you have bleeding, or you have uh, medications that, uh, like diuretics, that decrease the preload, most people are very preload dependent. And when you're on the medications like this lady that cause uh, vasodilatation, like an ACE inhibitor or a, uh, actually she was on ACE inhibitor and a amlodipine calcium channel blocker. So both of them would dilate uh, and cause increase in the gradient there. So actually what happens when you drive them even more by, by giving this lady more Lasix, the obstruction is gonna get worse and the gradient is gonna get worse. So that's gonna actually, uh, be counterintuitive when you see somebody with a wet x-ray or B lines on ultrasound. So the reason I want to share this case is one of my pet peeves when people see B lines or they see big JVP, they just diarise the patient as always being the answer. And that's not always the case. Most of the time you may be correct, but you know, if think of this case or like tamponade, you don't want to diarise these people because they're preload dependent. If you diarise them, actually they, they can crash on you. So the treatment for these patients and this particular patient, you would want to make sure she's on a beta blocker, stop the vasodilators that she's on. And sometimes she needs a little bit of a fluid just to open up that outflow tract so she's able to push some blood out of the ventricle. So otherwise, you're really struggling with uh, your stroke volume here. So I uh, hope you uh, like the case and uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks so much for that case. That's uh, interesting. I'd heard about Mayo. Actually, I want to say they switch the images, but it's that your call it cardiology does not switch the images like we do in American <laughs> cardiology there. I yeah. also wondered, I think it's the projection we're seeing here, but I would wonder about amyloid or something. We're seeing these in actually both of the last cardiac ones we've seen this, these little hyperechoic kind of heterogeneous um, yeah. things in the, in the myocardium. And I've heard that described in... Um, in amyloid. So myself, uh, you know, I, if I saw something like this, I probably again would get, I don't mean to keep pushing formal echoes, but something like that, I wouldn't make that diagnosis on my own. Uh, but I, I think it's just a projection we're seeing uh, when it, we get these downloaded and then we put them back on the web. But I don't know if that, anyone else has heard about that or seen cases of that. Yeah, and no, I think in the acute setting, uh, it's really you want to try your best to avoid causing more obstruction. So whether it's amyloid or hypertensive heart disease, but definitely looks like amyloid. We did not, you know, lady did not want any more follow up. Uh, so basically she got better with symptomatic management. So we didn't, she was not interested in any further workup, which understandably so, but yes, it would look similar. It would cause this, you know, LVH all over and uh, potentially, uh, you know, depending on what kind of amyloid, if it's a TTR or not, there are some treatments, but you know, in her age and everything else, she did well with medical therapy. So she was not interested any more work up. Yeah, interesting. Thanks for that great case, another good one. Okay, moving right along, uh, we're gonna take it to New York City now to um, hear from Gina Bai, who's gonna talk to us a little about, about air uh, in some of the wrong places. Um, she's coming to us from uh, New York, uh, Cornell. Gina? Yes, hi. So I have a patient who's a 74 year old uh, male with obesity who came to emergency room with fever, cough, hypoxia, progressed to respiratory failure, secondary to COVID-19. He was intubated and came to our ICU and in ICU he was paralyzed, prone and received like, empiric antibiotic, remdesivir and plaquenil. 
And about 10 days into ICU stay, um, he developed leukocytosis and we got chest x-ray and he was incidentally found with a pneumomediastinum and subcutaneous emphysema. Here's a CT scan. Uh, we got it for other reasons, but it was just a cool um, CT scan. So you can see uh, on the left side, there's a small uh, pneumothorax and also you can see pneumomediastinum. And on the right side, you can see large pneumo uh, peritoneum. So I decide to uh, scan the patient. And for focus of beginners, long point is defined as point where the visceral pleura uh, begin to separate from the parietal pleura, and it's diagnostic for pneumothorax. Here I'm using the curvilinear probe and uh, you can not see the ribs, uh, rib shadow because my probe is actually right in between the rib space. But you can see in this image on the left side, uh, you see the long sliding as the two pleura rubs each other with B lines. And on the right side, there's no long sliding. And there's a shadow of an A line on the right side, they're perfect. And this uh, is uh, called long point right there. Yep, next slide. Oh, yeah, yes. So this is a very similar uh, image from prior one, but here you can see the pocket of air in the middle with the A line, and there you, do, you don't see any long sliding, but on both sides on the left and right, you can see the long sliding and the long coming in and out of view. And there's, a, there's a two long points here. Um, I use the linear probe in this view to see, uh, to compare different uh, probes. And you can here also see the B lines on the left side and A line on the right side. That's the, and that's also long point. Here I wanted to also note that there's a, poor lung sliding here. Like you cannot see the usual like shimmering of the lung sliding. And you can sometimes see this for, uh, with a patient who's intubated uh, with a high PIB that we use sometime for this COVID ARDS patients. And um, I wanted to just include a slide where I use a face array probe uh, for lung point. It's usually not the best probe to use uh, because you cannot really see the lung sliding sliding very well. Um, but here I was lucky enough to find the long point. Uh, it's similar to prior images. Uh, you see the long sliding on the left side with a B line and um, A line on the right side without any long sliding. So this is uh, my last image and this is we are getting out of the lung and this is actually in the abdomen. So my probe is on the right upper quadrant of the abdomen. And you can see um, there's a right kidney on the left. And behind it is the liver. And if you see on the right side, there's a A line, which doesn't belong there. So you're not supposed to have a free air in the peritoneum. So having the A line on the, uh, in the peritoneal cavity this is a diagnostic for pneumoperitoneum because it, it represents uh, free air. So that's my case. Tina, thanks so much for that. I, you know, it's, I found it hard sometimes to differentiate free air in the abdomen versus in the bowels. It's certainly been called to do paracentesis and see free air in there. It can be obvious when there's a lot of fluid, but Dr. Matthews, can you chime in about how you differentiate that sometimes? Uh, sure, Gordy. I, I think, first of all, uh, Gina, this was uh, fantastic. Thanks for representing the physician assistant community. And also, that was a double uh, lung point. That was pretty impressive. Nice to see that. Uh, I didn't get to see that many times. Uh, getting back to your question about um, free air versus, uh, I guess you're asking about luminal, uh, kind of bowel gas too, okay? So I think uh, the two things I look for, it is tough. First of all, I'll just say it is challenging, especially with people that have um, elevated BMI. It can be very challenging to uh, differentiate, but I look at motility and distance. So motility, the reflections of a kind of bowel gas uh, really changes with uh, what? A contraction and relaxation, right? So you should be able to see some reflection changing with that contraction if you're to wait, uh, wait some time. The second thing I would say is distance. So 
reverberation artifacts, as you can see in here, it's really uh, equidistant, right? Equidistant points. If the reflections start deeper in the belly, as opposed to right, right near the peritoneum, then it's likely interluminal in origin as well. So those would be my key points. And then transverse longitudinal kind of walking through um, where things are at would be my start away. But I come back to it, it is tough. So it is okay and, and advised to use advanced imaging uh, to confirm and support your differential. So that's my uh, cop out answer as well. How about that, Gordy? That sounds good. I'll All keep right. trying. And <laughs> thanks again, Gina. That's a great case. I hope you guys are doing better with that. What people tell me is a bad flu that's going around now. It's not really a reason to shut down, but I hope New York is better. So um, next we have Matt Grace coming to us probably from the finest residency in the whole uh, nation is what Dr. Matthews has told me from Portland, Oregon, Legacy Health. And he's going to talk to us about uh, fluid that isn't necessarily only in the gallbladder. Yeah, thanks for having me. So this was a 63-year-old female who came in with a chief complaint of abdominal pain and weakness. The uh, pain was located in the right upper quadrant. She described it as sharp, and it had been getting worse over the past several weeks, but really she's been having this for several years. Associated factors were nausea, vomiting, and then anorexia as well, and nothing made this better for her. She had a um, a uh, past medical history of chronic pancreatitis that was listed in the chart and chronicle cystitis without any definitive etiology. She also had atrial fibrillation on apixaban and hypertension. And these were the meds she was uh, taking, metoprolol, um, amlodipine, apixaban, and then albuterol as well. Socially, she was a retired janitor and she had a pretty extensive smoking history and really drank a half bottle of vodka each day um, with a remote history of meth use as well. On exam, her vitals, she was normotensive, uh, tachycardic to 115, and she was febrile to 38.9. She appeared ill and just generally weak. Uh, she had a fast heart rate with an irregular rhythm. On abdominal exam, she had right upper quadrant tenderness um, that kind of radiated posteriorly, but she didn't have a, a distended abdomen and there was no rebounding or guarding. These were her labs, uh, really significant for a white count of 18,000 and a hemoglobin of 6.7, which was down from nine uh, that was checked a week ago. Uh, and her chemistry is really significant for elevated AST and ALT. Uh, and a total billy, it looks like it was cut off, was 2.1. So. so she, the emergency room tried to have her admitted to surgery and they refused um, to admit her being a poor surgical candidate. And so the medical team did a right upper quadrant ultrasound and we can see the liver there on the right um, with this swirling motion in the center. We got a CT scan of the abdomen, which you can see it showed a large uh, fluid filled collection in the periportal region that extended into the right lobe of the liver. And so at this point, I think we were thinking this was uh, an abscess, um, but the radiologist actually made the diagnosis of a right hepatic artery pseudoaneurysm that had an intraparenchymal hematoma. So she was actually transferred to another hospital with hepatobiliary um, services, and she underwent angiogram coiling and had no further episodes of bleeding. Oh, thanks so much. Uh... Appreciate it, Matthew, going through that. Um, Gordy, have you seen uh, this type of uh, pseudoaneurysm before? Is, or do we have any other tips for that? I can think there no. was some I what, What's up your there. experience been? That was the number one for me. Yeah, boy, this is a rare one. I think um, years ago, there was a case in uh, an organization we had kind of heard of, but I, I wasn't the one who had done the ultrasound for, but I think it's definitely rare, but I think in the past decade, the more you work in situations with uh, I think trauma, endovascular procedures that you get to see. Um, I think severe pancreatitis, you get to see some of this. And I think one of our rheumatologists said there was a case with a connective tissue disease and polyarteritis nodosa kind of went through it. But I think the main take takeaways were what uh, Dr. Grayson talked about. If you see an anechoic round cystic structure, you have a differential. But I think what makes it tricky is as soon as you see swirling, some sort of a swirling material within it, um, I think people call it a yin yang appearance. And so once you see that, have a differential that's broader than your usual. And so that's when you can probably move into advanced imaging. But if you wanted to follow that along, you can see if it's a vascular channel or something and put some color Doppler on there and see if it connects uh, to the artery of origin. So 
it, it is, uh, it takes some broadening the differential right off the bat. Again, um, it, as a ultrasound diagnostician, make sure you keep thinking through the differential as you're putting the hands on the patient and the transducer. So fantastic case. Uh, thanks again for leading off with this. Appreciate it. Yeah, I noticed that patient had chronic cholecystitis there on CT too. So you can't just anchor on things, you know, and getting the probe out. Sometimes you've fallen or discover things rather that uh, you didn't necessarily expect. Right. Perfect. Yeah. And I think it comes back to those things, get multiple views and uh, try to put color on these images to kind of move things along sometimes if you're in doubt. So perfect. I'm going to keep moving along here. Uh, next, we have Dr. Max Didums. Uh, he's from UNC Chapel Hill. He's an internal medicine third year resident, and he's going to uh, talk to us about urine, good hands with ultrasound. <laughs> what a title. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, an astounding title, if I don't say so. Hey, um, so I've got a little case for you from the cardiology service. We have a 60 year old gentleman who comes in with heart failure and some decreasing urine output. Um, he was admitted initially, usual, he has uh, EF of 25 to 35%. He has some subacute fluid overload, the usual story. But down in the ER, he had to have a Foley place because he's got some BPH and they gave him some Lasix and he had a high PVR after they gave him that initial furosemide. Um, it seemed to be working, but throughout the day, the urine output just dropped off. And of course, right at shift change, uh, the nurse comes by and lets you know that there's really not much urine at all, despite the fact that we've doubled the Lasix dose twice now. You tell her to flush the Foley, um, and she says, oh, it flushes fine. It, uh, it's a little weird, though. It leaks around the catheter. It doesn't really flush back through the main channel very well. It's kind of weird. So what's going on? Do we need to go to the cardiac ICU? Do we need some dobutamine to get this refractory CHF going? Is there an obstruction? Do we need to press that urethra. What's going on here? So we did a POCUS, if you can believe that. Now you'll see here, I'll tell you ahead of time, we looked at the heart, the EF was still about baseline. He had some B lines on his lung ultrasound. It was beautiful, but it was still the same thing as before. But you see here, we've got some longitudinal and transverse views of the bladder. Now on the left side here, the marker dot on the left side of the screen points towards the patient's head. And we've got a black hypoechoic space, the bladder, full of urine with this weird sphere in the middle of it. Those don't usually belong there, but in this case it does. That is the Foley balloon. And surrounding it, you can see this white hyperechoic stuff blocking up the main passage. And also if you look over on the right side here too, we have our transverse view of the bladder. And as we fan from top to bottom, the marker dot in this case is faced towards the patient's right side. You see that sphere come into view again. That is the Foley balloon, fully inflated but obstructed in a large bladder, uh, urine filled bladder. So what did we learn from this one? When your urine output is low, even with a Foley in place, have a look with ultrasound. You can usually find some interesting problems that you can solve at bedside. In this case, um, we learned that they had actually placed a continuous bladder irrigation Foley or something like it. It had a third channel for flushing rather than using the main channel. And as the nurse was flushing through there, it uh, flushed perfectly. Uh, but didn't drain through the main channel. And after some more aggressive flushing through the drain, central drainage channel, um, we were able to dislodge the clot and get things going for the rest of the patient's admission. And he did fine. Um, one thing I will say, though, is it's very easy to say, uh, oh, well, why don't we just use the bladder scanner or something like that? Watch out for ascites. Bladder ultrasound is really underestimated, especially in this era of paying attention to cauties. Um, a large pocket of pelvic ascites can look an awful lot like a very full bladder. And if you look at this image over here on the right, um, you can see those pelvic ascites right on top of a decompressed bladder with that Foley catheter balloon sitting right there in the middle there. So you can do a lot of good. You can fix a Foley. You can prevent a Foley. I've done that more than a couple times. And you can spare yourself a consult to urology uh, and keep them um, free of that uh, overnight. Um, but if you're, if you're in trouble, Try a bladder focus. Hey, Max, thanks so much for that case. It's funny, just on call the other night, I had the same exact situation, only it was blood coming around the catheter and the, and the focus is so helpful to look in there and see actually what's going on and was able to troubleshoot the case and get through it really quick. Um, Dr. Matthews, wasn't the Foley catheter invented over there in Minnesota? <laughs> you guys must be experts. Yeah, good memory, uh, Gordy. Uh, you yeah. visited over here. I, th I think I took you on a tour and showed you the original Foley catheter wall. Yeah, it's yes. a, none other than uh, Frederick Foley. Uh, I don't know if you remember, uh, Gordy. I think we talked about the original Anchor Hospital here, and now it's Regions um, back in the 1920s. But did you know that the original intent of the Foley catheter uh, when he did it, it was for hemostasis after um, 
cystoscopic uh, prostatectomy. So it was originally meant to not drain urine. And so that, right. that's an intriguing finding that I think uh, now it's used for the opposite. It seems like it was working as designed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I didn't know that. So you have 10,000 lakes, but you have no bladders full of urine. That's great. All right. Um, so next we're moving on to Michael Northrup and really good to see some representation from our ultrasound fellows out there. So this is really cool. He's going to talk to us from Portland, Oregon about the world of plankton. Yeah, thanks, Gordy. Um, so we have a 39 year old man coming in uh, with a history of metastatic sarcoma who's had seven days of progressive dyspnea on exertion and some right sided chest discomfort. Um, his history is significant for uh, sarcoma that was uh, surgically excised from his left humerus and then he subsequently underwent uh, chemo uh, and radiation therapy. Um, up to about a week ago, he was feeling great. He was even running um, daily, but has developed sort of this mild dry cough, but no fevers, night sweats, or unintentional weight loss. So on exam, uh, he's a bit, he's tachycardic and tachypnic, but satting okay. He is in some moderate distress though, leaning forward to breathe. Uh, you don't hear any murmurs. He doesn't have a distended, distended neck veins and his extremities look okay. Uh, but there are uh, notably diminished uh, breath sounds on the right. And has got a non-tender abdom uh, abdominal exam. So here um, you decide to perform a POCUS exam and um, you're sort of in the mid axillary line at the uh, right lung base and you'll see sort of the inferiorly you'll uh, you see liver parenchyma with diaphragm and then uh, so like sort of a anechoic space uh, above and with a positive spine sign so you know there's fluid there and then uh, consolidated lung and kind of as Dr. Werner had mentioned in his presentation um, it looks like volume loss and static static air bronchograms and then additionally you have this um, sort of fibrin stranding. Um, and if you look closely to it, the fluid, it looks a little more um, um, echogenic than normal. It's not just anechoic, so you think more about a sort of complex pleural effusion. Um, so you decide to scan a little bit more. And here, uh, still mid axillary line at the right base, you can see the kidney, so we're at the retroperitoneal area, but uh, kind of strikingly, you don't see any liver parenchyma. Um, so something to consider, we'll talk about um, soon. You also notice there's that sort of hyperechoic um, focus just above the diaphragm with that plankton uh, swirling debris around it. Again, looking at it from another view, it notice too, it doesn't seem to communicate with with lung. So even though it's hyperechoic, you might think that there uh, is that some sort of like lung tissue, that, but it, it just doesn't communicate with the, the lung more superior. So thinking it might probably is something else. And then, you know, anytime there's a question, uh, just to sort of ad advance our own POCUS learning, in this case, this gentleman had some advanced uh, chest imaging. So on the left, in a transverse cut, you'll see there's the pleural effusion and it's actually pushing the liver sort of uh, medially. Uh, and so when we're in the mid axillary line, kind of looking retroperitoneal where we see the kidney and spine, that's the reason we didn't see the liver because it's actually being pushed out of the way. And you can see how big that pleural effusion is in the coronal cut on the right. So, uh, you know, this case, I think, highlights an interesting finding that a large pleural effusion can actually move um, and distort the liver parenchyma. And then it also highlights sort of a complex uh, pleural effusion. So when you have that um, increased echogenicity in the fluid, think, um, think complex pleural effusion. Uh, it also had the fibrin stranding in the plankton sign, uh, which is that swirling debris. And then interestingly, you know, trying to explain that hyperechoic structure, uh, the CT surgeons, when they were doing a pleurodesis, uh, noted sort of metastatic pleural disease. So likely a pleural met is our sort of most likely explanation at this point. And then, um, you know, 
everything is also sort of differentiating sort of a, consolid, a consolidated lung, right? It can be, um, is it consolidation due to like a pneumonia or is it just compressive atelectasis and uh, his history and sort of exam find, or POCUS findings really pointed toward compressive atelectasis. Thanks, Michael. That's a very unfortunate uh, case, but very interesting and a good learning potential there. Um, it reminds me about a lot of these cases we're looking at ultrasound and then we're um, looking back or ordering formal studies and we can compare the two and it's a fantastic way to learn. Even if you're in places where you don't have someone to mentor you and certainly nobody has someone at the bedside all the time, but that's a way that I continue to learn myself by comparing those uh, images. So thanks for that case. Yeah, next uh, we're going to introduce Florian Saddlemacher, uh, another uh, organ health uh, uh, ultrasound fellow here coming in. And this time he's going to be talking about the pandemic ultrasound. So excited to hear from Florian. So take it away. Hi, thank you, Benji. Um, all right, so as um, part of my fellowship, I also started working once a week in our newly opened respiratory clinic here at OHSU. And it was in the beginning of um, no, it's like in, in mid, about four weeks ago that I saw in our newly opened respiratory clinic, this 81 year old um, lady that presented, um, um, and, well, this lady with a past medical history of diabetes and COPD who presented with a dry cough, um, fatigue and fevers of up to 104, which had started about eight days prior to the presentation. Um, the patient had spent, um, Easter weekend, um, four days prior to the onset of her symptoms with her family. And her daughter-in-law um, had tested positive for COVID-19 two days after that meeting. It has to be said that the um, daughter-in-law um, is uh, working in the healthcare field and she was exposed to somebody with COVID-19, which is why she was tested, um, not because she was positive. So she was asymptomatic at the time that she spent the time with my patient. Um, so this is like this patient's main um, risk factor here. Um, she, however, when she presented to the clinic, she already reported feeling a lot better. She felt like that her cough was overall getting better and she didn't feel quite as ill anymore. Um, and then um, next slide on um, the exam. Um, First of all, like the vital signs were fairly normal. She was like slightly hypertensive, um, but she was febrile and oxygenated actually quite well at 95% on room air. Um, then on um, exam, um, she was very well appearing, not very ill at all and no respiratory distress. And on auscultation, her lungs sounded completely normal and so was her pulmonary exam. She, they were um, clear, the, both lung sides, sides were like clear to auscultation. There was no wheezing or rails. Um, so I moved on now to a um, point of care, um, to a point of care ultrasound exam of her lungs. And um, it should be said that um, since this pandemic started, we have been um, getting a lot of information from our colleagues in both China and um, Italy who have found that um, when examining patients with suspected COVID, that especially the posterior lung fields are very um, helpful. So I had started um, examining patients um, um, when doing a pulmonary ultrasound exam, not just with a classic um, four fields. The, usually we do the anterior, um, the Pajali zones one and two, and then the lateral um, three and four. And we now moved on to also include posterior lung fields, um, which are just called five and six. Yeah? And obviously you do that on both sides. And so this patient showed signs of like moderate to severe disease consistent with, um, with COVID. And um, we're, we're seeing here in um, the zone labeled right ventri uh, right um, the jolly zone two, we're seeing like an irregular plural line and subplural consolidations. Maybe um, you could like point that out, the consolidation that you're seeing just underneath the plural line there with some B, scattered B lines coming off there. And then in the zone three here in the midline, we're seeing scattered B lines. For some reason, the video is not playing, but um, the um, uh, scattered B lines on the, on the um, 
there, yeah. And on the posterior lung field, we're seeing kind of like a, confer a confluent B lines, and it's like almost like a widened out appearance. Um, yeah. So like, um, even though this patient presented clinically um, quite well, she, her um, pulmonary ultrasound told uh, told me a different story. Um, um, can we move on to the next slide? Um, the, the the patient she was as I mentioned, not actually all that ill-appearing. She was in no respiratory distress. She was oxygenating well. We had set a cutoff at 90, of 93% for the oxygen saturation um, as to when to send the patients um, over to, to be admitted. Um, and so this patient didn't meet any of these criteria. We decided to send her back home. I, however, given the um, the um, pulmonary ultrasound findings I had set up for a virtual follow-up visit for the next day. And obviously the patient was tested for COVID, which not surprisingly came back positive the next day. During the virtual follow-up visit, the patient reported actually that her cough had by now completely resolved and she was feeling much better. Um, but then um, another two days later, now three days after I saw her, she came back this time to the ED and due to short, worsening shortness of breath, she was now saturating at 88% and was admitted on six liters. And then another two days later, the patient had actually to be transferred um, over to the medical ICU, now on six liters per high flow nasal cannula, um, which kind of like shows us the rapid development of, of um, this disease. Um, Miraculously, this patient actually recovered. And after being in the um, medical ICU for two weeks, she had, was able to be, um, we were able to downgrade her and she was eventually discharged back home. But the learning point is kind of like that, um, the point of care ultrasound kind of like gave me a better idea on um, the severity of her disease and that she needed to be very closely monitored. Yeah, that's, that's my case. Thank you. Oh, yeah, thanks. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, and I, I had the opportunity to work a couple of weeks in New York, and oftentimes there the diagnosis was made. Everyone had COVID, but it also is so helpful. And Dr. Dansel uh, has pointed this out in the chat box as well about a lung ultrasound. Not only can help you with the diagnosis, confirm your suspicion and severity, but also just working up hypoxia in general, looking at effusions, consolidations, pneumothorax, and actually outperforms uh, chest X-rays. So thanks for those. Uh, comments. Now uh, we're going to introduce the next speaker. Uh, Gordy, do you want to introduce uh, your folks from the West Coast there? Oh yeah, we got someone from the Inland Empire here. We have Christine Janke, or Janke, uh, who's coming as who's a PGY2 from Spokane, Washington, and she's going to talk to us about some plug pipes. Yeah, hi. Um, so I'm here with my attending and POCUS mentor, Dr. Kong Zhang. And so our case is going to describe using POCUS to detect small bowel obstruction. So going ahead, our patient is a 63-year-old with comorbidities including type 2 diabetes and Crohn's disease. They presented to our ED with acute onset of abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, and three days of decreased oral intake. On exam, she appeared uncomfortable, dehydrated, with active dry heaving. She was tachycardic and her abdominal exam revealed a soft distended abdomen with high pitched bowel tones and diffuse tenderness. Our pre pocus differential was broad and included peptic ulcer disease, pancreatitis, mesenteric ischemia, Crohn's flare or small bowel obstruction. Um, however, pocus was extremely valuable to narrow our differential. So here you can see a video of our abdominal pocus exam. You can appreciate the hypochoic bowel and notice the whirling of bowel contents within it that are not unidirectional, but actually move to and fro, signifying abnormal per peristalsis. Additionally, the bowel is dilated in circumference beyond the cutoff of two and a half centimeters, and the plicae circularis are also visible on imaging. Uh, the same findings were noticed in three loops of small bowel, and this constellation of our clinical exam, in, in addition to POCUS, increased our suspicion to SBO versus ileus, and our patient's diagnosis of SBO was confirmed with CT imaging. Freezing the image allows the use of calipers to measure the circumference of the small bowel, which as you can see is dilated at over three centimeters. As I mentioned, greater than two and a half centimeters is suggestive of small bowel obstruction. And we'll discuss literature supporting this in subsequent slides. Uh, the visible projections into the small bowel lumen become apparent in SBO 
and these are referred to as the keyboard sign. They also aid in differentiating, differentiating between large bowel and small. And thirdly, the to and fro motion of bowel contents is a strong indication of bowel obstruction as well. Finally, you should capture all of these POCUS findings in three or more small bowel segments to make an absolute diagnosis. So how to, using a low frequency probe, either a curvilinear or phased array, you scan the entire abdomen systematically. Uh, we recommend starting in the right lower quadrant and scanning transversely throughout all quadrants as if you were mowing the lawn and then repeat the entire scan in a longitudinal fashion. It's quite easy. Yeah, and those are the three findings again. Um, so some current literature, a 2020 prospectic, sp prospective study of 125 patients in an academic ED, they compared the time to diagnosis of SVO between CT, X-ray, and POCUS. And as you can see, bedside ultrasound had an average time to diagnosis of 11 minutes compared to CT taking on average three hours and 42 minutes. And a 2018 meta-analysis, it consisted of 11 studies and nearly 1,200 patients demonstrated greater than 90% sensitivity specificity and a remarkable positive likelihood ratio of 27 and negative likelihood ratio of 0 0.08 with use of POCUS for SBO. So in conclusion, POCUS for detecting small bowel obstruction is fast, easy to perform, and highly accurate. Thank you. Thanks so much for that case, that's great. Um, Benji, can you tell us a little bit about, I've heard about the rule of threes or the rule of twos uh, with small bowel obstructions. We just had a case today when I was admitting actually. Yeah, sure. Uh, no, thank you for this case. This was fantastic. What a series of 12 fantastic cases you know, from around the nation world. and. Uh, from uh, physician assistants, residents to attendings. I love it, uh, I love this. So this case, SBO, uh, to be honest, it is challenging. I, and I would say um, uh, the rule of twos I can go through, but then also give you some caveats. So rule of twos, I've, I've often said it's uh, greater than two centimeters of dilation, greater than two millimeters of bowel wall thickness, greater than two loops of bowel, and the last one's a little cheeky, I suppose, to and fro movement, right? Uh, so I think in the sense that it, it does not, uh, the numbers are pretty darn good here, but when you're starting, especially, I would say if you don't see a transition point, it's a little tricky here, uh, but it doesn't necessarily confirm all the time to me, but it does definitely move the differential and really helps me narrow and uh, helps my diagnostic momentum change uh, and helps my differential quite a bit. So I think it's a powerful tool still. I uh, just have to have some caveats on uh, how you're using it. So, uh, Gordy, I just want to transition back to you. So, uh, Dr. Johnson, give us some uh, high level tips as we summarize this uh, day here. 12 fantastic cases here. Uh, we have some uh, notes from some of our faculty experts throughout the nation that they've been chiming in. Gordy, do you want to summarize some of that and then let us know where do we go from here with uh, point of care ultrasound and the significant interest group community? Yeah, thanks, Benji. Um, definitely just a couple of comments like Dr. Minsa from uh, Cornell also mentioned, he's seen to and fro movement with some normal bowel before. So be careful as we always say, and people just continuing to drive home the point. One view is no view. In other words, if you see an abnormality, you make sure that you prove it in another view. And, um, and also just keep scanning. It, it, it adds a lot. I'm preaching to the choir here, but uh, to your professional satisfaction, the safety of your patients, the patients love it. It's a great opportunity to educate them about the, what's going on. If you've already got a CT, it's okay to go ahead and scan them. Even if you're learning, again, it's an opportunity for you to learn and your patient uh, to learn also what's going on. 